countdown to Mars continues. The perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the Red Planet. Good afternoon. NASA's Mars Perseverance rover launched from Earth six months ago, and now we are less than a day away from touchdown on the red planet. The rover will attempt to land in Jezero Crater tomorrow. It's the most difficult landing site on Mars ever attempted, but the Perseverance rover and the team are ready. Welcome to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. I'm Marina Jurica, your host today, as we bring you a closer look into Perseverance's journey to search for signs of ancient life and how the next mission, Mars Sample Return, will bring samples from the surface of Mars back to Earth. As we are social distancing, I will introduce you to our panel here and those joining us virtually. On our panel today are NASA Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Thomas Zerbuchen. JPL's Director of Solar System Exploration, Bobby Braun. The European Space Agency Director of Human and Robotic Exploration, David Parker. Director of NASA's Astrobiology Program, Mary Wojtek. Perseverance Deputy Project Scientist, Ken Williford. Sample Return Scientist and Professor at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Elizabeth Hausrath. For anyone watching who would like to submit a question, you can do so by using the Countdown to Mars hashtag. Our phone lines are now open to the media. You can ask a question by pressing star one to enter the queue. To start, I'd like to welcome Thomas Zerbuchen. Good afternoon, Dr. Z. I'm so glad to be here, Marina. Thanks so much. And I'm just in awe because we're like a day out uh, from going back into history, you know, landing in this ancient lake bed in search for, for potential ancient life. And that, of course, is a culmination of decades of work by NASA and the international community and is built by all directorates with many individuals around the United States and internationally contributing. What we're going to talk about today has to do with this. Look at this right now. It's a sample tube. If I turn it around, I see the number 53 on it. And I remember from various meetings I've been in that there's something like 70 of those, and some of them with specific numbers are right now hurling towards Mars. It's about that sample tube that so much of this panel will be about. The goal, of course, is to collect promising samples in this super clean tube. And it's analogs, of course, the ones up there uh, toward going towards Mars. And really collecting uh, those samples as a first step of the most difficult missions, or one of the most difficult missions ever undertaken. It's, of course, trying to make significant progress in answering one of the questions that has been with us for many centuries. Namely, are we alone? in the universe. Our robotic geologist and astrobiologist is poised to help find answers just like the great geologists on Earth. It's not just about the sample, it's about the geologic context of that sample that will also be explored. And it will do so at Jezero Crater with a set of the, some of the most advanced instruments ever conceived and designed supporting that amazing collection. An amazing drilling and caching system is at the heart of our really the interface between the rock where all these treasures are and the samples that eventually will be with us. These samples will be returned, triple sealed, 
and at the cleanliness level hardly ever achieved, uh, certainly in modern times, uh, in kind of, and, and ensure that the samples are pristine and protected. We're looking for ancient life, as I said at the beginning. Mars surface today, especially where we're going, is not hospitable for life, we believe, because of the absence of water, the freezing cold landscape and the radiation that constantly showers the surface as we see it there. But we know due to the rovers and orbiters of the past and the present that Mars has had a wet past. And as we go to Jethro, we go to the most promising site to really unlock the information about that wet past and the question, was there ancient life during that period where on Earth life was arising? The Mars sample return is of high importance to the agency, the science community overall, and it has been a goal that many scientists have been thinking about for decades. And what we did is as we thought about Mars sample return, I actually commissioned an independent review just a few months ago and asked some of the best minds all over at the US and beyond a simple question, which is, are we ready to proceed with Mars sample return technically? And the answer was really simple, and it's an answer that uh, we, we are glad to receive, and that is the committee told us we are ready. And to do so, as uh, the international community in partnership with ESA uh, to really go and build that uh, sample return. So while we're awaiting a safe and successful landing, we remember, of course, this is difficult to achieve. There are many panels that have talked about this, but I'm really excited to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Bobby Brown, to talk about the Mars sample return campaign. Bobby. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Thomas. Uh, it's great to be here today, and it's great to be with you. Uh, it's a super exciting time here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as we await Perseverance's landing tomorrow. Uh, I'm also really excited to get to represent the Mars Sample Return Program and all the people around the world that are working on that program already. Mars Sample Return is the planetary science endeavor of our generation. It's ambitious, it's challenging, it's scientifically compelling goal that over decades we have been working towards and it's, it's right there, it's just within our reach. And within, with the launch and tomorrow's landing of Perseverance, the Mars sample return science activities can begin on the surface of Mars. Uh, as an engineer, I'm in awe of what the Perseverance uh, team has done uh, over these past few years, what they've accomplished. Uh, but I'd like to take a minute and describe to you how we're building upon Perseverance's science mission in the development of the next two flight missions whose goal together is to return the Perseverance acquired samples from Earth, uh, to Earth uh, to study in laboratories across the globe with instrumentation that just simply can't be miniaturized and, and qualified for spaceflight. Uh, this next graphic shows the four elements of the Mars sample return campaign. Uh, Perseverance on the left, uh, nearly, on, nearly at the Mars surface, about ready to begin this science journey. Uh, and then the next two flight elements, which are presently in development, the sample retrieval lander mission and the Earth return orbiter mission. I'm going to describe those uh, to you in a little bit more detail. And then out of ways, we're going to be work developing a sample return handling facility that will acquire and uh, curate and even distribute uh, the samples when they're back at Earth. Three missions and one ground element working together to accomplish sample return. Now the thing that binds those missions together is sitting, a mock-up at least, is sitting here with me today. Uh, this is the bottom half of the Mars sample return sample container. And you can see uh, for scale, I have two of the sample tubes that Dr. Z just held up uh, in placed in this container. Uh, this container can, can, can hold up to 30 samples uh, and it is uh, much like the baton in a relay race, this container is the heart of sample return because the sample tubes will be filled by perseverance. The sample retrieval lander will 
uh, house this container, and the, they'll be placed within. And then this, the third element, the Earth Return Orbiter, will bring this container, triply sealed, uh, back to the Earth. Uh, so this next slide uh, describes the sample retrieval lander in a little more detail. Uh, it, like Perseverance, will be an amazing engineering achievement. Uh, on its way to, to Mars, it'll look a lot like Perseverance does today, buttoned up in its aeroshell with a cruise stage, uh, controlling its journey through interplanetary space. It'll fly through the Mars atmosphere with an aeroshell, a heat shield, if you will, and a parachute, as shown in this slide. Uh, and those systems are built upon what Perseverance will demonstrate tomorrow. Now, the one addition from a technology standpoint uh, for that lander is the, is the uh, inclusion of propellant to fly out errors and to do truly a pinpoint landing on the surface of Mars. Because unlike Perseverance, which is a mission of exploration and discovery, the sample retrieval lander will be sent to a specific spot on Mars where Perseverance has already cached its samples in a depot on the Mars surface. We're gonna know before the sample retrieval lander launches exactly where that spot is, and we're gonna land within about 100 yards of that spot on the surface of Mars. This graphic, the next one, yeah, this one, shows uh, a notional traverse of perseverance that, may, that it may take across the Mars surface. Now, today, of course, we don't know precisely how perseverance will venture across Mars and what it will find. But we've analyzed hundreds of traverses that it may take. And across those traverses, we've found places, many safe zones, where we can land with our pinpoint landing technology, uh, the largest lander that will have been sent to Mars uh, at that time, the sample retrieval lander. And we can deploy a fetch rover that can uh, traverse the surface to the depot and bring those samples back to the lander. So in this next slide, which is an animation, you'll see, yeah, go to the next slide. There you go. You'll see the sample fetch rover uh, deployed on the surface. And in this uh, artist concept, there's just one tube that it's picking up. But you, you see its tray there is already full because it's picked up quite a few others. And then it's going to head back to the sample uh, retrieval lander when its tray is full of, of tubes. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, once this, either the sample fetch rover or Perseverance itself loads the samples into this canister, the canister which is already inside the Mars Ascent Vehicle, a rocket uh, on the Mars surface, that rocket will carry this canister, sealed, uh, into orbit uh, about Mars. Here, on this next video, that orbiting sample, this container itself, uh, will be in Mars orbit and will ultimately uh, be captured by the Earth Return Orbiter. Uh, within the payload of the Earth Return Orbiter, it'll be sealed yet again and placed inside the Earth Entry Vehicle uh, that'll contain the samples for its flight uh, through the Earth's atmosphere. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, upon return to Earth. The Earth Return Orbiter itself is a tremendous spacecraft. It's the largest uh, spacecraft we will have built and sent to Mars specifically for this purpose. Uh, our architecture allows us to send the lander mission and or the orbiter mission to Mars in either 2026 or 2028. And those two launches and those two missions are being managed together by NASA and the European Space Agency. In fact, today there's a large group of engineers and scientists across both NASA and European Space Agency sites that are already working uh, on these missions. And it's wonderful to be working in partnership with the European Space Agency on this endeavor. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn the conversation over to David Parker. David is the ESA Director of Human and Robotic Exploration, and he'll tell you a little bit more about this journey. David. Thank you very much, Bobby. That was fascinating, I think. And I'm also really excited uh, that we're just hours away from the landing perseverance. 
any mission to Mars is exciting, but because it's the start of the Mars sample return campaign, it's super exciting. And it's something I've been dreaming about for nearly 20 years from when ESA first started studies for such a mission. Now, hopefully you know that ESA, the European Space Agency, is a club of 22 countries who pool their efforts in exploring and using space for everyday life. And Canada is a long-standing cooperating state, and this is important for me to mention, because Canada is also part of the MSR campaign via ESA. Now, within the huge range of ESA's projects and monitoring climate change with Copernicus, providing global navigation with Galileo, Mars Sample Return is part of our growing space exploration program. And we have the privilege to work with uh, NASA every single day, just as Bobby mentioned. Our space exploration focuses on uh, destinations where humans will one day live and work. We're already living and working in low Earth orbit aboard the space station, of course, and we're on our way going forward to Mars, uh, and ESA is also part of the Artemis program working with NASA. Now, as far as Mars is concerned, we already have two missions there, starting with our Mars Express spacecraft back in 2003, doing fantastic science. And indeed, MSR is about fantastic science. Mars Sample Return is a great science mission. But for me, it's also a voyage of exploration in the grand tradition. We all look forward to boots on Mars, but before sending humans, a round trip with robots will teach us a great deal. It's kind of a scale model for an eventual human exploration. It's the first round trip to the surface of another planet. So let me take a few minutes just to explain the European Mars program. Uh, our two orbiters, Mars Express, ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, doing great science. In fact, just last week, ExoMars made the front page of uh, uh, the journal, yes, next slide, please. Na the uh, journal Na uh, Nature Geosciences with a discovery of previously undetected hydrogen chloride gas in the atmosphere of Mars. It's mapped subsurface water to exquisite accuracy, and it also relays about half the data back from NASA's existing rovers. So meanwhile, with our Russian partner, Roscosmos, we are also preparing to launch next year a rover mission. The Rosalind Franklin rover is an astrobiology probe to search for evidence of past life um, using a drill penetrating six feet below the surface of Mars, and therefore below the damage caused by that radiation that Thomas mentioned that destroys any organic chemicals close to the surface. And then we have our contributions to Mars Sample Return, comprising the Earth Return Orbiter, the Sample Fetch Rover that Bobby has mentioned, and also the robotic arm for transferring those samples between the rovers and into that special container that Bobby showed us. So let me say a little bit more about the rover and the orbiter. So next slide, please. Here's a picture of the Sample Fetch Rover. It's much smaller than Perseverance, its single task is to race out from the sample retrieval lander in this relay race, find and collect those sample tubes and bring them back to the, to the lander. So compared to current rovers, it's small and neat. It's got to travel 10 times faster than current rovers using its own ball onboard intelligence. Development has already started with Airbus Defence and Space in the UK, building on know-how from the Rosalind Franklin rover. So while the sample fetch rover is small and fast, here's the Earth return orbiter, Eero for short. It's simply huge, with a wingspan of about 120 feet. It's as big as an airliner. Launched an Ariane 6 4 rocket from our European spaceport. It, this six and a half ton cargo ship is propelled by both chemical rockets and the most powerful iron drive electric propulsion system ever used in a deep space mission. So it must scoop up the container, as Bobby described, uh, in orbit around Mars, and then do the home run back to Earth. So on its cargo deck will be NASA's sample containment system, an Earth uh, entry vehicle that will land back on Earth. So again, the Earth return orbit is already under contract. We're already building it with the European Dream Team, with extensive knowledge from deep space missions like the Ros Rosetta Comet Chaser, Bepi Colombo, which is our mission on the way to Mercury, and also the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter itself. So in summary, um, I hope I've convinced you that the European Space Agency is also super excited to be part of this Mars, Mars Sample Return campaign. It's really the most extraordinary, mind-bendingly complicated, and will be history-making exploration campaign. But having said all that, you may also want to know why we so much want to do MSR. Why do we want to bring the samples back? So to answer that, I would like to hand over to Mary Wojtek from NASA HQ. Thank you, David. 
Well, you've just heard details of this collaborative, multi-generational, truly bold mission, including that we are sending a robotic astrobiologist. What's astrobiology? It's the study of how we get from materials from our star all the way through the steps that it takes to build habitable planets and support an environment from which Earth, um, from which life could emerge um, to a verdant planet like Earth. So that's what astrobiology is about. And it answers three very important questions. And those questions are displayed in the slide. Where did we come from? How did we evolve to inhabit the Earth? And is there anybody else out there? This mission is going to look and address that final question. And how have we been prepping for this? Well, our strategy as astrobiologists has been to try to understand everything we possibly can about the biology here on Earth. So how did life emerge? What are its requirements? What are the environmental conditions that can support life? Or what are those limits where you might be able to find life here on, on Earth? And indeed, most of the places that we've looked, we have found life no matter how harsh the environment is. We combine, can we go back to that other slide? Um, thank you. Um, maybe not, there we go. Um, we combined all that we understand about what life needs, and we map that onto other places in our solar system and even beyond to try to determine other potential habitable environments and therefore targets for our missions. Now, Mars has been a focus since the very beginning of us talking about where we might find life, and we've successfully flown orbiters, landers, and rovers to characterize Mars and have studied environments related to Mars-like conditions here on Earth. And in the next slide, I just wanna share a couple of those with you. Uh, so I'm a microbiologist by training, uh, and I've studied life in, in some of the harshest environments on Earth. And these are just photos from a few of the places that I've been. The top three pictures are from the dry valleys of Antarctica near the McMurdo Sound. This environment is dry, extremely cold, and yet you can find organisms here and they're metabolizing and, um, and, and active. But it looks a lot mineralogically like Mars as well. The two lower pictures are from Svalbard. This is a place where um, I went with a number of scientists that were PIs on instruments on Curi the Curiosity rover and on the ExoMars rover that David just talked about. They used this environment again, which was very similar in temperature and mineralogical conditions to test their instruments, put it through their paces, see if the things could actually detect the chemicals and um, photograph the, the textures and characterize the mineralogy of the environment as was needed in order for Curiosity and in the future ExoMars um, to carry out its mission. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned the Curiosity mission, and that is, was, has been an, an amazing uh, one of our missions. Its original goal was to investigate habitability in Gale Crater, or as my colleague Pan Conrad likes to say, it's checking out the real estate. But in this case, instead of for looking for good schools or community services, Curiosity went up there to check out the climate, look for sources of energy, look for the elements that are the building blocks of life, and found a number of areas that, that would support life. Can I have the next slide, please? So in eight years of exploration, it found areas that were, there were clearly evidence of water. There were clearly evidence of chemicals that could, could be involved in energy transduction. And there were the elements that are needed, the primary ones, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And as this periodic table is in the picture for, life also needs small amounts from other elements as well. And many of those were found in Gale Crater as well. And that set us to select Jezero Crater for this very important mission. So Perseverance is going to go to Jezero Crater. It's going to characterize the environment much like Curiosity did, but it's going to start to look for evidence of past life. Now it has an incredible challenge, and if I could have my next slide, please. So the challenge is finding a biosignature. Biosignatures are evidence of life, and they can be, take all sorts of forms. They can be chemical, they can be structures, they can be modifications to the environment. And in general, one of the challenges 
are that many of the features that we see that are biosignatures can only be produced by life. So if you look at the top left corner, the lower box is clearly a fossil of a, a, an ancient animal here on Earth. But the upper picture just above it that looks like a plant is actually formed by a biological processes. That's just precipitation of minerals, and yet it looks very much like life. And so there are other processes besides life that can make a biosignature or something that looks like one. There are other, uh, I, this particular mission is finding itself in more the gray area where ambiguous features are what we'll be looking at. Those that could potentially be made by life. There are also processes that we know that may also uh, produce them abiologically, but we're going to have instruments, particularly when we bring the samples back, that will be able to distinguish that. So Ken, who's coming up next, is going to talk a little bit about stromatolites, which are in the upper right corner, so I'm not talking much about that, but I will mention the figure in the lower right is an example of the more complex measurements that we will be able to make with the samples that we return from this very important mission to try to really confirm if things that we believe the perseverance observed could be evidence of ancient life. And with that, I'd like to just say that we astrobiologists have been dreaming about this mission for decades. And I'd like to turn it over to my fellow astrobiologist and the Mars 2020 deputy scientist, Ken Williford. Thanks, Mary, and hello, everyone. Um, I want to say, like the others have, how fortunate I feel uh, to be in this in this place and at this place in time. How excited I am to be literally on the eve of uh, of this historic and really this, this grand cooperation. I mean, it, it's an enormous undertaking uh, that we're we're uh, that's in front of us, um, and it has enormous scientific potential. Uh, potential to really be transformative. These are the truly big questions that we're after. Uh, as you've heard, um, you know we know from uh, from prior rover missions and and work done from Earth uh, and from our orbiters around Mars, we have very strong evidence that Mars could have supported life uh, in its distant past. The question is. Was Mars ever a living planet? You know, um, is Earth, which we know clearly is friendly to life today, and as far as we can tell from the geologic record, has been friendly to life uh, throughout its uh, its entire history, nearly its entire history, uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, is that just an anomaly? Is it a fluke? Are we alone in the darkness, you know, spinning around the sun? spinning around the galactic center? Or are there other places out there uh, that harbor life and, and potentially even in our own solar system? So that's what we're setting out to do starting tomorrow when we get to the surface of Mars. But what are we gonna look for? And uh, you know, to put it most basically, we're looking for lifelike patterns in the, in the exploration environment. So here you see an image, uh, I'm also gonna hold up the real deal here, I don't know if I'll have it in the same orientation for you, and hopefully my camera can get some focus. This is, as Mary said, she used the word stromatolite. And so stromatolites, and this one originally would have been like this. When I, I picked it up like this, it was a dome-shaped thing. And so you're looking at the eroded top-down view of the in internal structure of this thing. And these finely wrinkled layers, uh, beautiful sort of organic looking, if you like, uh, textures. We use this word texture in geology to basically mean shape. We sometimes call it, say morphologies. So these shapes, these lifelike patterns that we see in the rocks are obviously part of it. What caused this pattern? Well, this, this uh, fossil I picked up from an environment not at all dissimilar to, to where we're going with Mars 2020. This was from a 2.7 billion year old lake deposit in Western Australia, uh, an area called the Tumbiana Formation. Uh, and so, so these rocks were deposited long before, billions of years before complex multicellular uh, life arose on Earth, things like animals and plants. And so when we find fossils in rocks of, of this age, especially ancient uh, age, they were made 
completely from microorganisms. So these are single celled organisms that sometimes join together in communities that live in layers, one on top of the other, and sometimes exuding sticky substances from their cells in which sediment particles can be trapped and bound. Uh, also, the organisms themselves can stimulate precipitation of minerals onto their little bodies, uh, which then creates a fossil. Uh, right there in place. And so you're looking at a fossilized microbial mat uh, that formed on the edge of a lake, you know, nearly 3 billion years ago. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for. But as Mary pointed out, looks can be deceiving, right? We have to be very careful not to fool ourselves. And so looks are almost never enough. And as Mary said, also, you know, we may get so lucky as to find something, uh, you know, so beautifully preserved as this stromatolite that I showed you. But far more likely is that anything we find will be much more ambiguous. That's typically the case on, on Earth as well. And so we have to look at the compositions. We're looking for lifelike shapes and lifelike compositions, chemical compositions. So the elements, the minerals, the molecules, the organic mo molecules that we know are associated with life. We're looking for all those things occurring together. And this is why we have this incredibly capable scientific payload on our rover. But this is only the beginning. Of course, as you've heard, the exciting part, all that engineering happens. We get the samples back on Earth uh, someday. And we have uh, folks on our team now, a group of people called the Return Sample Science Participating Scientists, who are representing the interest of those, those future workers. And so I'll pass it now to Libby Hausrath, who is, is one of our return sample science participating scientists to tell you more about how all that's gonna work. Thank you, Ken. As others have said, I am very excited to be one of the return sample scientists working on the Mars 2020 mission. My job is to represent the interests of these future scientists who will study these samples once they're returned using cutting edge techniques in Earth's laboratories. In selecting the samples, we're gonna to try to address this main, one of these main goals of the mission, which is to determine whether ancient life existed at Jezero Crater. We will use the instruments on the mission, this is an artist's rendition of the SuperCam instrument, to select samples to try to be able to answer that question. As Mary mentioned, we will look for samples that have evidence of past habitable conditions. Next slide, please. This is an image showing the characteristics that can indicate past habitability, such as evidence of liquid water, which is needed for all life as we know it, uh, raw materials, energy sources, and sufficiently favorable conditions. Next slide, please. We will also look for samples that have evidence of conditions that can preserve past evidence of life. Past evidence of life can include organics, minerals, morphology and structure, chemistry and isotopes, uh, and some materials, such as clay minerals and silica, are very good at preserving ancient life on Earth. And so we will look for these types of materials to sample on Mars. Next slide, please. These samples with the potential past life that they may contain within them represent an amazing opportunity for future scientists. And so I'd like to say a few words to future scientists who may be students or even children right now. We all know that studying science and doing science can sometimes be discouraging. Science is hard. Science is hard for everybody. So just because it's hard for you doesn't mean that you aren't going to be good at it. It might be that you aren't as good at it yet as you will be, and more practice and more experience will be helpful. It might be that you are good at it right now and it's just hard. And so what I would like to say to the future scientists is that perseverance is well named. Perseverance is what it takes to be a scientist. And I would encourage everybody who's interested in studying science to please persevere. If you feel discouraged, perhaps reach out to a mentor or seek peer support. Because when these samples come back, we need the best scientists from all backgrounds to help us work on these amazing scientific questions. Next slide, please. Because when the samples come back, we will be able to analyze them here in the best laboratories on Earth. This is an image of a synchrotron facility, and for scale, those are cars in the parking lot. We can't take this to Mars with us, but what we can do is bring the samples back. As you have seen, the samples will be about the size of a piece of chalk, and we will be able to analyze them using techniques that require such small amounts, 
it's difficult to see. This is an image of one of our samples that was analyzed at the synchrotron on the tip of the capillary tube that is so small, it's hard to see in this photo. So when we can analyze these samples using these fine scale techniques back here on Earth, that is when the story really begins. Back to you, Marina. Thank you so much, Libby. And thank you so much to all of our panelists, presenters. We are now ready to take media questions. Remember to press star one to get put in the queue and please direct your questions to one of the panelists. We're also taking questions through the hashtag countdown to Mars. Our first question comes from Jeff Faust with Space News. Good afternoon, Jeff. Good afternoon. Uh, question for Thomas or Bobby. Uh, you mentioned the Independent uh, Review Board report. Uh, that included a number of findings and recommendations about potential changes to the architecture, cost, schedule from our sample return. Uh, I wanted to see if you could provide an update in terms of what NASA is doing to review or implement those recommendations and when we might see any sort of changes or decisions not to change uh, the overall architecture from our sample return. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. That's a, a great question. Very well informed. Uh, so that the board that Thomas referenced was an outstanding board, and we've, we're taking the findings and recommendations uh, from that report very seriously. So the program now, the, the, the flight missions that I was referring to that are in development, we're in what's called phase A. And phase A is uh, part of the formulation of these missions. We don't have a firm baseline at NASA for the way we're gonna do these missions until the end of, of phase A. And so as part of our phase A studies, we are, we've incorporated the findings and recommendations uh, from that board report. So we're still looking at a number of trades. We were looking at a number of different trades ourselves and we've added uh, to that trade space based on the report. And we plan to respond uh, fully to all of those uh, actions by the end of this, this phase that we're in now. And that'll be at the, uh, you know, somewhere around October of 2021. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Bobby. Our next caller is Mike Wall with space.com. Good afternoon, Mike. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, thank you all. Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, best of luck tomorrow to everyone. Um, I'm, I'm interested in there's, there's like there's one aspect of, of the return to Earth that I don't think we've talked about that much, and that's where these samples are, are going to be housed, the, the like new sample return facility. So I just like, I mean, like, is there any news about what the planning for that involves at the moment and when, what the timeline is for, um, for, for when that facility is going to be sort of greenlit and built and what, what it's going to look like? What, what, what sort of buildings are you using as, as a model for that facility down the road, do you think? Thank you. I'm going to start by answering the question. I'll kick it over to Bobby for more technical details. But you should know, just as part of the kind of re response relative as part of that phase A work that Bobby referred to. We're also looking at the ground systems now, and we're kicking that off uh, as a really deliberate study, uh, looking uh, with the international community at what needs to happen, considering all the elements that are, are there. Remember, when they hit the ground from the beginning, we want to make sure that we are protected against all eventualities. And needless to say, there's a lot of uh, knowledge we can gain from other people who are dealing with, uh, with unknown kind of chemicals, unknown agents. And that's, that's kind of the first phase, kind of the sample uh, retrieving facility phase. And then, you know, there's a process by which we release those samples with a very, very high likelihood and kind of very freely uh, with, you know, according to, to the various uh, principles that we're setting out. So we're right in the middle of, the, of this. And, and just like we said, uh, this is not yet uh, concluded. But uh, Bobby, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, just very quickly add, um, you know, just the time frame here, right? So the new missions that we're talking about will launch in 26 or 28. The samples will come back to Earth in the early 2030s. So there's a good bit of, you know, there's a decade between now and the time that the samples would be needed to go into the facility. We are looking at both uh, modification to existing facilities and creation uh, of new facilities, but that's a study that's uh, you know, just ongoing. 
Thank you to Dr. Z and to Bobby. Next caller is Keith Cowing from NASA Watch. Good afternoon, Keith. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so Dr. Zabukin, with regard to the exploration of Mars, just as with, is the case with the moon, there's a growing international presence in orbit on the surface. Indeed, the UAE and China joined the Mars Club just last week. But just as things are becoming more complex with lunar exploration, when the issues of planetary protection, orbital traffic management, communications, and science collaboration demonstrate a need for the establishment of what many people would call good practices on Mars, especially in advance of possible commercial human missions. Specifically, should something akin to the Artemis Accords, which were developed for the moon, also be a good thing to think about establishing for the exploration of Mars? Thanks so much, Keith, for your uh, question. You are, of course, correct. Uh, that is that uh, kind of exploration of Mars is one that has uh, many players now, and we're so excited about the two missions that arrived only days or weeks ago. You know, we celebrate all peaceful exploration of outer space, and especially as it's done, kind of individual countries kind of uh, spending their own treasure towards, uh, you know, benefiting the science community as a whole. So we're really glad for that. It is also true that as we already have a number of spacecraft in orbit around Mars, for example, we've had actually a number of discussions and bilateral discussions with the community overall just to make sure that these assets are safe as they're in orbit around it. And so it's discussions of that type as a, the community overall needs to really focus on uh, just for the benefit of all players that are uh, you know, in orbit uh, right now. It's also true that uh, with the Artemis Accords, as you said, uh, uh, Jeff, of course, uh, uh, sorry, Keith, uh, of course, is that uh, with the Artemis Accords, we're really seeking to kind of create a platform for that when, with multiple signees already uh, in the national community. I think we're, as we're getting experience uh, from the moon, you know, it's very much worth thinking about what the framework is in which we expand that uh, going forward, especially as we would expect because of the excitement of Mars, there will be multiple players still that will uh, enter kind of the community of uh, Mars explorers uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Keith, and thank you to Dr. Z. Remember to press star one to get into the queue if you are on the phone lines. We are now going to turn to a social media question. Jeannie on Facebook asks, how long will Perseverance be collecting those samples on Mars? Ken, would you like to take that? Sure, uh, great question. We hope for, for a, a good long time. We have a primary mission uh, something's called the prime mission of one Mars year, and that's about two Earth years. Um, and so we're all signed up to to a mission that uh, you know allows us to explore the Jezero system for for about two Earth years, collecting samples um, and assembling a, a returnable cache of samples. Uh, if we're fortunate enough to have a, a functioning spacecraft and all the resources uh, we need to do to accomplish it, we'd like to continue that exploration. In fact, onto the crater rim and, and even beyond Jezero where there are some incredibly exciting uh, rocks that are quite different uh, from the rocks in Jezero Crater and would allow us to, to massively expand the, the scientific value um, of our cache. And so, you know, that, that could be a number of years, but as you've heard from, um, from the others on the panel, uh, we've got a ways to go before that uh, sample retrieval lander arrives. Thank you, Ken. Our next caller is Ken Creamer from Space Up Close. Good afternoon, Ken. Ah, good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for taking my question, and good luck again to everybody. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the facility. Why You already have the Lunar Planetary Lab. I'm curious, why do you need a new facility, if you could go into that a little bit. And uh, also, why is the Earth's return orbiter the biggest one ever sent to Mars? Thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so uh, what I tried to say earlier was that we were considering multiple options for the facility, including modification of existing facilities and the potential uh, for a new facility. 
uh, there will need to be uh, in place protocols uh, for the creation of these samples that's a bit different than the existing protocols, for instance, from uh, lunar samples uh, because of the science uh, and, and the origin of the samples themselves. Uh, in terms of the Earth return orbiter, I'll, I'll start, uh, since I'm speaking, I'll start and I'll kick it over to David in just a minute. But the size of the solar arrays is driven uh, by the timeline constraints from Earth to Mars uh, and the fact that it's a, a low thrust uh, propulsion system that allows flexibility for us to maneuver and rendezvous with the, the sample system. Uh, David, did you want to add to that in any way? Yeah, uh, maybe the simplest way of answering the question is say it's the laws of physics because this is the, the first time a Mars spacecraft doesn't have to just get in, go to Mars, get into orbit around Mars. It's got to leave the orbit of Mars and come back again. So all the propellant you need to come back, we have to take with us on the way out there, which is why the spacecraft, the Aero, is actually in two pieces. It has a stage that is left behind at, uh, after the initial orbit insertion at Mars. So that's the chemi big uh, chemical propulsion module. Uh, that uh, does the first orbit insertion. Then we spiral down with the electric propulsion system to a low uh, Mars orbit do the sample capture uh, process and then spiral back out again and then depart for, for Earth. So it's because we have so many more maneuvers to do than any previous Mars mission. And that drives the size of it. Thank you, Bobby and David. Our next question on social media is Aaron on Facebook from his nine-year-old son. If you find any sort of life form, what would be the next step? Mary, would you like to take that? Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, I think as we've tried to, to show you, it's going to be a real challenge finding uh, definitive evidence of past life. Uh, we're not really equipped in this mission to actually look for something that is living at present. And we don't think that we would find it in this particular site where we're going to investigate. This is a great site for uh, an ancient lake bed where we could find evidence of ancient life. Uh, it's going to take the measurements that we make actually on the planet, as well as measurements made by many scientists around the world when the samples are brought back. It's also gonna take a lot of discussion because as we mentioned, some of the things that we observe can be deceiving because it can be come from life, but it can also come from something that isn't related to life. And so we've got our work cut out with, for us, not just in collecting the right samples, but once they come back as well. And I just want you to know that NASA uh, and NASA scientists and all the scientists around the world that are working on this are going to apply the highest rigor in the analysis of this sample before we um, release any interpretation one way or the other. So I just wanted to add something for this. Uh nine-year-old future scientist, you know, let me just tell you what my first question would be. If you found life some, somewhere else, the first question would be, is it the same life we have on Earth or is, it, or is it entirely different? And let me tell you why I'm asking that question. You know, there's a really important fact about life on Earth, which is all life is related. Can you imagine that, whether you have like a mouse, whether you have some small kind of small cell uh, things or a giraffe or a human being, all life is related somehow. If you look kind of under a microscope, life is, looks kind of the same. And so for me, the first question would be, is that life that was found there the different life or really the same life again? You know, get, if you go from one thing to many things, it's just a huge step forward. And I still remember the first time we found planetary systems around another star. The only solar system we knew was our solar system and kind of in the mid 90s, well before you were born, we went to many planetary systems. We learned so much, not just about these systems, but our own system. And it's that kind of huge transition that we would focus on. Thank you, Mary and Dr. Z. Our next question along the same lines about focusing on searching for that past life. Holden asks, would you let the public know if evidence of past life was found? If so, how soon after finding it? 
One of the things we really believe in at NASA, and I know our European Space Agency friends are exactly the same, and that is that the work that we're finding, the research that we're finding, will be made public. And the answer, therefore, is absolutely. We would, with the due diligence that we always use in science and the peer review that is so critical to make sure that it's not an individual's opinion alone, but really work that uh, kind, of, uh, kind of reflects the scrutiny that we want in science, that once we're through that gate, of course, we would uh, communicate uh, to the entire uh, you know, uh, scientific and the broad community. So absolutely. And David, would you like to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I mean, one of the aspects of Mars sample return, why it's so important, is that we'll have samples not that won't just be studied by one scientist in one laboratory, but by scientists and laboratories all around the world. Because if we believe we found a evidence of ancient life, that's a very extraordinary uh, claim, and therefore we need extraordinary evidence. And we would expect different laboratories studying in different ways the same samples um, to give us the same message. Uh, if only one lab laboratory says yes and all the others say no, then we have to keep looking. Thank you, Dr. Z and David. Next, a Mark on Facebook asks, how will the future missions find these samples? Wouldn't dust cover them? Bobby? Uh, yeah, that's actually a great question and something that we've studied at depth. And the, the simple answer is no. Uh, when Perseverance uh, places the samples down on the Mars surface, we're going to know precisely where Perseverance is and so where the samples are placed. Uh, there may be some dust uh, that accumulates, but the sample tubes themselves are not going to move across the surface. So they'll be basically tagged, uh, located uh, for all time. And then we will land the sample retrieval lander and the sample fetch rover as close to those, to those locations as possible. Thank you, Bobby. Our next question comes from Nathan on Instagram asking, what will the scientists approach be when the samples return to Earth? Will they ever be displayed in a museum? Libby, would you take that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, in terms of the approach, I'd like to echo many of the things that um, have been said about uh, the importance of multiple lines of evidence. So scientists will use one of the reasons the biosignature figure that I did is that one of the things scientists will be looking for is multiple lines of evidence for um, for life and I don't know as um, others have talked about the the plans for the sample um, are uh, are still in the work I am I imagine that it will be possible to see some in some cases great thank you so much Libby and Darius on Twitter asks, how will information from this mission help with the challenge of getting humans to Mars? Dr. Z? We're really excited about this mission because in so many ways it opens doors for new technologies that are exactly doing what is being asked, getting, trying to, for us to learn how to get humans to Mars. In part, that has to do with the precise landing technology that uh, Bobby already talked about. It's also about the MOXIE instrument, which, uh, of course, is trying to take uh, carbon dioxide, you know, the atmosphere of Mars and making breathable oxygen out of it or oxygen we could be using for fuel. But I think the other thing I also want to talk about is, is whenever we land with humans, we want to know what we're going to meet, kind of in terms of uh, the history, but also in terms of the composition overall. And the samples in many ways, even from that perspective, are really adding important information to address that question. So the, the Perseverance mission, uh, especially together with its more sample return partner, with all the technologies that were being talked about earlier, really are a step in the direction of human exploration to Mars. Thank you so much, Dr. Z. A truly exciting time ahead of us for sure. Well, we unfortunately can't answer all the media questions on air. For those of you with additional questions, please call JPL's Digital News and Media Office. We'll also continue to answer social media questions online. Thank you for your questions and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Perseverance is set to land on Mars tomorrow with commentary beginning at 11.15 a.m. Pacific 
Standard Time to 15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we are offering lots of ways to ride along with us. To join the virtual NASA social and virtual guest events, register for the Mission to Mars Student Challenge and live stream the Mars landing. Visit go.nasa.gov slash Mars 2020 toolkit. For those of you interested in a deeper dive, we have a new press kit available online too with lots of information and graphics describing the rover and its mission. There you'll also have a chance to sign up to send your name to Mars on NASA's next flight to the Red Planet and put yourself right into the action with our Perseverance photo booth. You can pose next to the rover, place yourself in our mission control, and even see what you might look like taking a selfie on the Red Planet. Again, it's all available at go.nasa dot gov slash mars 2020 toolkit if you're on social media join the conversation with the mission on facebook and twitter follow at nasa persevere and use the hashtag countdown to mars thank you so much for watching and joining us this afternoon and go perseverance <laughs>